spirit, a room in our hearts. Uh, we want to leave changed and unchanged. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. In Genesis chapter 1 here, I go to the very beginning of the Bible because any great godly concept can be found usually throughout the whole Bible, the beginning all the way to the end. We're not re-preaching our creation month where we saw everything that God did. Uh, the title for my sermon tonight is Abortion, Gun Control, and Christianity. And these things really do go hand in hand. It works together. Uh, we give away these bumper stickers, and if you don't have one, take one. There's a bunch of them back there. I'm just going to oh, oh, let's put it the right way. I'm going to stick one on the board uh, to keep your focus here. Now, uh, I did this in a particular order for a particular way. There's another version of this you can find on Amazon. If you want one, uh, if anybody's watching on the internet and you want one, you can have one for free. Send me your address. I'll mail it to you. I'll put a postage stamp on it. Check it out. Pro-God, this must come first. When it says God, it doesn't just say any God. It's not some cloud. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians were saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in His finished work. It's not by our own work. So we are pro-God and His name is Jesus Christ. We are pro-life. Life begins at conception at the moment that the womb receives the seed. That's a blessing from God. God opens the womb and life is happening at that moment. There was a man, what was his name, Onan, that spilled his seed on the ground and God smote him for his wickedness and that's not something Christians should do. We are pro-God, we are pro-life, and we're also pro-gun. Now, Brother Ross would hear he tell you that's a, a 1911 and that's the only gun fit for carrying. Uh, Brother Doug would say you got to have a Glock. I don't know, I'm a Smith & Wesson guy personally. Whatever you choose to carry is irrelevant because back then it was a sword and a spear and there were many men in the Bible that were commanded by God to carry something to defend their family. These are godly concepts. And today this seems to be a, a matter of strife and controversy that, oh, you want to defend your family? No, no, no. The Second Amendment was just written to go out and hunt some deer. Uh, no, it wasn't. It's very clear. It's to protect your possessions and your, your own life and posterity. This is what it's for. You say, uh, Pastor Fannin, you're not allowed to preach a political sermon. Don't you know Christians aren't allowed to be political? Didn't you get that memo? You know, the separation of church and state, that's not even what it's about. It's trying to say, keep your state out of my church. They have no business telling us what to do. And you say, oh, well, well aren't you going to lose your 501c3 status? Well, let's be clear. We are not 501c3. Amen. We are a local body. We are local believers. The word church means congregation. It's the assembly. We meet in a building. It's called the church house, as God told us to. And we come together as often as we can. And we're here to honor God, not the state. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. Frankly, I've never seen a candidate in the past 30, 40, 50, 100 years that's worth his salt worth saying, yeah, that man's a good, godly Christian, and we ought to vote for him to support Christianity. And listen, I've been alive, I've supported guys, and I've seen guys, well, if we don't vote for Lucifer, the devil might get in. I mean, that's what they say every year, isn't it? Have you seen how bad the Democrats, they're running Lucifer, but don't worry, the, the Republicans, they've got the devil. So one or the other will get in either way. And you know what? That's this world. That's this kingdom. We are to be involved in politics, I believe, to a certain extent as Christians. You say, well, you can't preach a, a political sermon. Show me that in the Bible. Jesus had conversations with Pilate. Uh, let's take a step back. Moses. Moses rebuked Pharaoh, did he not? for rejecting God, for his wicked acts, for his abortion. Moses then, when he got in the wilderness and the children uh, of Israel, they started dancing around naked to wicked music to a calf. He rebuked them and he threw the Ten Commandments at them. Yeah. How about John the Baptist? Hey, being political is a very Baptist thing. John the Baptist lost his head for telling that wicked King Herod that he was an adulterer. Yeah. He was an adulterer. He was a wicked man. Listen, our confidence is not in the law, it's not in government, it's not in leaders. I'm not here to say, to rally a flag and say, did you see what happened up there that's a victory for us? I think all that's hogwash. You know what they do? They, they rule on something in your favor. What was it? Oh, help me out, somebody, in the history of it. It was in Defense of Marriage Act or something, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. And it's like, yeah, it was a victory, yeah, but you know what? Now... They can define it, or at least you think they can, and then they'll redefine it in 10, 15 years as something different. 
marriage is two people, a man and a wife, and they should stay married forever. That's God's will. I don't want to get off too far on any of this, but I just do want you to know this. Our confidence is not in the government. Our confidence is not in their law. Oh, look, they're ruling in our direction. Look, I do count it a victory. Any time an abortion clinic can get shut down and their children that are being spared from the scalpel. That's a, that is a blessing. There is a curse on our nation right now, if you haven't figured it out. These God-hating liberals want to destroy everything godly and Christian, and it's starting to affect us. It's going to destroy our economy. It may bring war or civil war here. And this is the devil's plan to divide and to conquer. The thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and destroy. And that's what he wants to do to our country and our children. Well, we should stand and fight with our words. We should stand up for what's right, and we should stand for godliness. The liberals of today, they hate God, they hate Christianity. It's like they want your child to be executed in the womb. They are pro-abortion, which means they love death. They love death. Oh, but what about if somebody gets forced? Does that mean you execute the child? Does that mean you execute the child if, if their daddy was guilty of that kind of crime? The liberals of today in America, America is almost not, it's not l recognizable. And I use that term generically. I think you understand what I'm saying as far as liberals. You know, the, the Bible, when it uses the word liberal, it's about the distribution of the saints and how our love should be liberal. There's things that we should do. Uh, but the liberals, that, that uh, they don't want God. They want to take your children, put them in public school. These same ones want, want to have the right, they say, to destroy a, a child of a life while it's still in the womb. And if they miss them there, then they want to get in the textbooks and they want to pervert your children by teaching them some sodomite doctrine or putting weird, perverse things in front of them. They worship the earth, don't they? They worship human bodies. They worship animals, but uh, they don't worship God. They love plants and animals more than they love human beings. This is the result today. Uh, their mind is defiled. Their conscience is seared. And they curse all of God's best blessings, don't they? The great things that God has for us, uh, they don't like it. They curse it. They don't want it. Uh, you know, what's it say in Proverbs? All they that hate me love death. Yeah, well, that's the abortion crowd. What's he say in Romans? They worship and serve creatures more than the Creator. Oh, save the dolphin. Save the snail. Save the frog. How about save the baby while it's still in the womb? Yeah. The first law given to man, the very first law that God gave to mankind, is found in Genesis 1.28. Let's take a look. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This is God's commandment for you to have a family. This is God's will that we would reproduce ourselves physically, and obviously there's the picture here that we would do it spiritually as well. We'd go out and preach the gospel, right? But here, the very first law given to man is to have children. Now, if the devil's going to attack, where is he going to attack? Genesis chapter 1. We learned that as we went through the Bible. If you remember, if you want to, the, the easiest way to spot a false Bible is to look at Genesis 1:1, where it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All the fake Bibles say the heavens, plural, thereby making the creation day number two a contradiction because they're saying, oh, God already created the heavens. And then what's he do? He creates the heavens. No, he created the heaven first and the earth, the spiritual realm and the terrestrial realm. After that, he began to divide them up and uh, put things in them as he saw fit in his particular order. So, of course, Genesis 1 is under attack, not just the first verse, but many of them in here. And the one we're talking about today is verse 28 about being fruitful and multiplying that's our commandment, to have children. You say, what's my purpose in life to have a family? What's my purpose in life to fear God and keep the commandments? We saw that this morning in Ecclesiastes. Well, what's the second commandment? And it's in the same verse. The second law was to have power and authority over the animals and the plants. Look at verse 28, second half of it. Uh, it says, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. He goes on and says, you have dominion over the herbs and the trees, and oh no, they're cutting the trees down. Oh, well, that's what God gave them to us for. Now look, I'm not saying be an unwise steward. I'm not saying destroy whole economy, you know, the, just the whole area. I'm not saying that by any means. But if I have a piece of land, I should not have to ask for government permission to cut a tree down, or to build a mound, or to build a lake. I should not have to ask some wicked 
good government if that's okay with them. Oh, but don't you know, there might be a snail down there and God forbid the snail should die. Yeah, well, I need water to feed my chickens. Oh, you can't feed them. I mean, it's such a, uh, an imbalance that we have today. And the first and the second law, right here in this verse, and it's to have a family, but then it's to have power and authority that we execute over this earth. These are the resources that God has given us. He has given the animals for us to eat. He's given us the trees for us to eat and to burn for wood and build houses and that sort of thing. And uh, the deranged liberal of today, they love their dog and they love their fern more than they do their parents or their children. Yeah. It's gotten so bizarre. Yeah. If you would go to Genesis 14, please. Go to Genesis chapter 14. Protecting life and the right of self-defense, these are biblical doctrines. We should have the right to have children, and there is no right to kill a child like they want to advocate for. Uh, abortion on demand without a reason. Oh, we just, we're, we're just, we're not ready yet. We're trying to have a career. That's not right. That's wicked. Now listen, I know that there are Christians that have had abortions, and thank God that he's a forgiving God. But this information should come to you, and you should receive it, and you should do the right thing. It's our job to preach this to those that are lost, or even to Christians that are, don't understand because they're too busy watching television instead of reading the Bible. It's our job to open our mouth and do everything we can to protect the life of the innocent. Protecting life and the right of self-defense, these are biblical concepts, they're biblical doctrines, and they need to be taught, and they need to be defended. You're in Genesis 14. Look at verse number 14. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Now that's what I'm talking about. That's a family member protecting another family member. Self-defense and defending your own and defending those that you love and defending those that can't defend themselves. Go to Exodus chapter 1. I do believe that training to defend your family with weapons is an honorable thing. You should learn to do it with your hands. You should learn to do it with your mind and your mouth and your back and yeah, a, a pistol or a sword or a machete, whatever you have to do. And I am not advocating for uh, starting a militia or uh, rioting against the government, anything uh, rebellious, if you will. I, I'm talking about good godly examples in the Bible that you should be able to defend your household. That's God's plan. That is God's purpose for putting a man over the household. That's his will, is that we would stand and defend the innocent. It is a godly duty to provide protection for your house. Period. You say, well, I don't know about that. That seems a little extreme. Are you telling me I need to, uh, you know, start buying guns more than food? No. Uh, buying food is part of the protection plan. Having windows in your house, that's kind of a protection thing. You know, right? <laughs> Protects from the outdoor. Think about it. We're here to protect them. You're in Exodus chapter 1. I want you to see this where they try to euthanize. Look at verse number 10. This is abortion in the Bible. Exodus 1, verse number 10. Come on. Let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply. This is the wicked system, the satanic government trying to kill God's people. He says, come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also with their enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. This is what's called today eugenics. This is choosing to kill somebody based on their race. It's abortion. It's birth control. There, have been, there is a dark history in America as there is in many other countries. It is not right to kill somebody by their race. We're all of one race. We all share one blood. All nations of one blood. There's the human race and to hate somebody on their appearance is a wicked sin. It is wrong in God's eyes, and we should not do it. But this is Satan's spiritual deception coming in to destroy life from the beginning. If we can just kill the young ones, we'll weed out this population. Look at verse 15. Exodus 1, verse number 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shipra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men, children alive. What a blessing. What a blessing. They were more afraid of God than they were the king. If you get a note from the government that says, by the way, if you get pregnant and you're going to have a son, if you don't kill your son, we will. You know what? You fight against that. You stand for the truth. You stand for life. That is evil. That's wicked. And it's deceptive. They obeyed God rather than man. And listen, 
any law that goes against the Bible is unlawful. Any law that stands against God's word is a law that you break and you defend God's word above man. Go to Exodus 21. If you remember when David, with Bathsheba, he lost that child as a judgment that came on his house. When that David's lost child, he said, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. I want to tell you, we will see babies in heaven. Uh, now listen, the only way to go to heaven is to be perfect. Well, none of us can do that. Okay, so how else does it work? Well, you have to be saved. Well, how do I do that? Well, you have to be consciously aware of the gospel, understand your guilt of the sin that you've broken the law, and perceive, you have to be able to comprehend these things, the gospel, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we don't baptize babies, because you have to get baptized after you're saved, not before you're saved, or not to be saved, right? Well, so the Catholic Church, who persecuted many Christians, they were baptizing babies. This was the sign of a false church and this is a big deal because listen babies that cannot comprehend the gospel according to the word of God he says their angel doth always stand before my face David couldn't be clearer here this child that had began to grow up had died this child could not comprehend the gospel nor believe on the promises of God for salvation therefore that child is safe with God any child that dies before the age of accountability is safe they're not saved but they are safe because God is merciful and long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. He is a good God. We will see babies. They count as a person. Listen, from the time that parents come together and seed is received inside of the womb, that's life. That's the beginning of life. This system today, this allopathic medical system, they prefer to cut or burn or drug you. They want to drug the patients. and, and you know, uh, It's fake science in a lot of ways. The stats have proven that death by doctor or medical errors really is one of the top causes for human damage or, or for injury from the doctor. This is such a big problem. In 2013, they said it's the third leading cause of death in America, more so than heart disease. Or it was right there with heart disease at the time. Now it continues to happen. Misdiagnosis, or we've given the wrong thing, or too much of the wrong thing, or, oh, they're having a problem breathing, let's put a face mask on them and, and suffocate them. I mean, it's, it's just wicked how the medical system, they have, they're not really helping in a lot of ways. And look, you need to go to the hospital, go to the hospital, but you be careful. Don't listen to everything they say and receive it unbiasedly because there's a difference between homeopathic or natural versus allopathic, which is, well, we need to cut something out, we need to burn something, we need to add some drugs to you, or the majority of our problems, if we look at it biblically, it's, well, there's a deficiency of a mineral or a vitamin, or maybe you need to add some sunlight. You think about it, there are things that, that there's another way, and I don't believe we can really trust this system anymore. I've known a lot of people that have told me, we were told not to have our baby because it would be a dangerous pregnancy and the mother might die. We were told not to have our baby because the baby would be mentally handicapped and it would just be such a burden, a financial burden. I've heard many people personally tell me this, that the doctor said I should abort. And we didn't. We took it on faith from God and the child is just as happy and normal and the birth was just as fine as could be. There's a problem with the medical system. There really is. You're in Exodus 21, Find verse number 22. When does life begin? Exodus 21, find verse number 22. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him. And he shall pay as the judges determine. What's he saying? A pregnant woman, two men are fighting, and something happens and she gets hit and the fruit of her womb, that child in her belly, dies. The baby dies. But what if mischief follows? Look at verse 23. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Let me give you an example. My wife was just recently pregnant. Let's say she's standing at the side and Brother John and I are uh, you know, arm wrestling or something. We're just being a little goofy and something happens and hits the baby and oh no, it's a miscarriage. Terrible thing. But it wasn't an intention to hurt the life. It would not require your life. There'd be a payment, whatever the husband determined. If I said, forgive you, I forgive you, then life goes on. But if 
There's an argument, a fight, and you're trying to get me, and you get her because you can't get to me, and it's obvious that your intentions were sinful, then you should die for the child of that life that's in the womb. I had a guy comment on, um, well, well if, uh, you're if, if you're asleep and you, you can't breathe for yourself and you're, and you're not eating for yourself, you're just hanging out in somebody's womb, that's not alive. And I said, oh, so when you're asleep, then you're not alive? It'll be safe to kill you? You're not sentient? You're not uh, consciously aware? They're able to drive a car while you're asleep? Neither can a child. And that's their argument. That's their false science. No, the, the child is aware. Children know. They, they know the voice of their father. They know when there's children outside of the womb. They respond to the things that are going on. They're alive according to God's word. And he says, if you destroy a life in the womb, your life should be taken from you. And that's God's judgment. Go to Exodus 22. Jesus said in Matthew 18, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Jesus said, if you want to hurt a child, it's better if you would hang yourself and drown yourself. You'd be better off in this life than to do that to a child. And that's the birth control pill. i got to tell you, that birth control pill it was funded by Planned Parenthood. It literally creates a, a chemical abortion inside of your body every month. It poisons your body to kill a life. And you are poisoning yourself. I do believe there's a connection between all the cancers that women have and the birth control pill. Yeah. The same liberal weirdos that want to make it where you can't raise children, they want to make it where you can't defend your family either. Well, you shouldn't be able to defend your family from riots and robberies and kidnappings and invasions and enemies of foreign or domestic, right? Oh, you don't need a gun. Nobody needs guns. We don't hunt anymore. We don't have to. We, it was just meant for an agrarian society that had to go out and protect against bears. That's not what it was for. We had just came out of a war where a tyrannical government, and by the way, I got to tell you, American history, they were killing Baptists. They were against the Bible preaching Baptists. If you weren't one of them, then you were an enemy. There were many of them that were locked up, chained up, whipped publicly, and even killed for their Bible beliefs. That is our history, and I thank God for the freedom and independence we have in America, but more important than what we have as a country, I'm thankful for the spiritual liberty that God gives us in this small church. This lo little local church is for these little families so we can raise up that next generation. And anybody that would infringe on these rights by saying, well, you should, you've got five already? You've got eight kids? Surely you should just start killing the other one after that. No, that's wrong. That's wicked. Right. Or God forbid, they say, you're not allowed to have a gun. Why should you be able to defend yourself? You know what happens when they make guns illegal? Only criminals have guns. Yeah. That's exactly how it works. You're in Exodus 22. Look at this. Look at verse... Verse 2, Exodus 22, 2. If a thief be found breaking up, in other words, breaking into your house, and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If somebody kicks in your door in the middle of the night or they crawl through a window, you hear somebody breaking into the kitchen, you come down the hallway, and you don't know what it is. You have every right to defend your family, and you take that life. That's justified in God's eyes. It is self-defense. They're in your house. It's self <laughs> they're in there to do bad, to do evil, to do harm, and you don't know what. And you don't want to wait and find out sometimes. And listen, this is important, though, because we're not to be just bloodthirsty looking for the opportunity. Uh, look at the next verse, verse Three, if the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood. There shall be blood shed for him, but he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he should be sold for his theft. You know what he's saying? You don't kill the guy. If you see somebody break in and they don't have a gun and they're not pointing a gun at your family and you catch them stealing your computer or whatever, or your iPad, whatever you got, your eye patch, right? <laughs> you catch them stealing something of value out of your house. Busted! What are you doing? You know? Well, I'm just going to take it. No, that's murder. You say, put it down. Lay down. We're going to call the cops. You're going to go to jail. You're going to go to the judge. They're going to give restitution. Uh, things will be adjudicated, but there's no need to take the life. And, of course, you know, you meet force, equal force with force, right? If somebody throws a punch, you don't shoot them. This should be common sense, but even our government would say these things. If somebody breaks into your house, you have the right to defend your house. You have the right to defend your family. But if you can clearly see there's no threat, you don't murder somebody. You don't execute them. Verse 4, if the theft be certainly found, 
in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. God, God has a plan for these things. Self-defense is justified. Go to Luke chapter 22, if you would. Luke chapter 22. In Proverbs 21, it says, The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. What a great verse that tells us two things. Number one, your greatest confidence is that God will protect you. But when, there's, when it's time to prepare the horse, your horse better be prepared. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Well, you know, I'm just, it's safety is of the Lord, brother. Well, you might want to prepare your horse. Yeah. It might not be a bad idea to have some protection prepared. Ultimately, our confidence is 100% in the Lord. There are men that have walked the worst streets in our nation for years preaching the gospel and never had a gun pulled on them, never had a foul word said. There are others that go out with guns and they, they get into strife often. I wonder about that myself. You know, maybe, maybe I'm going to work on being a peacemaker instead of looking for trouble. Well, maybe we'll get trouble today. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't want to go out looking for trouble. I want to go out looking for souls that want to be saved and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of Christianity. We're talking about these things in reference to this. We're talking about abortion and gun control as far as a Christian should be concerned. And this is the first thing. This is the most important thing making sure that we do things according to God's law and we honor Christ with all that we do. This is so important. What did Jesus say? You're in Luke 22, find verse number 35. Luke 22, verse number 35. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and without scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. And then said he unto them, But now, he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this is written, that this written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. He said, if you don't have a gun, go buy a gun. And they said, Lord, I've got a, a, a rifle and a pistol. And he said, that's enough. Now, you're not in sin if you don't have a rifle. You're not in sin if you don't have a gun. But I do want to be clear. I do believe it's the Christian duty of self-defense. I believe that we should stand and protect those that are drawn unto death, that can't defend themselves. We should stand and speak up and defend. But all the more, if you're in some situation, you see all these wicked school shootings. You know what this is? This is the fruit of the medical industrial complex. They put teenagers on psychotic drugs and then the parents won't raise them. They sit them in front of a TV and they play these games all day long. And I'm telling you, television is mind control. It gets in your mind, it changes who you are, it makes you do things that you wouldn't normally do. You're reacting to the programming, it's reprogramming your brain. They put them on drugs, they put these images in front of them and then they just go out and act it out. Many of them filled with devils. Many of them specifically targeting Christians. The solution to these mass shootings would be the second gun. You guys have heard that saying, how long does a mass shooting last? Well, until the second gun shows up. Yeah. And then they, end the, they, they cease. It stops the problem. As Christians, it would be a good thing if one day, you know, I hope, I hope all of you have guns and I hope none of you ever have to use them. That's my honest desire. And yet if you're standing there and you watch somebody slay the innocent and you have a chance to defend the innocent, praise the Lord for the lives that would be spared, that would be saved. Amen. You see how these th two things are tied together. And listen, the Creator who loves life wants us to defend life. Yep. The Creator who gives us physical life and also grants us eternal life. And this is the key. As Christians, I hope I never have to kill somebody. I'd rather hold them down and sit on their chest and then say, so... If you died today, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? Boy, talk about having a captive audience. <laughs> well, I grew up in church and I'm a really good person. You're a good person? Really? Come on. I'm having a hard time believing that, right? If I just repent of all my sins, yeah, once you're in jail, you won't be able to do this again. <laughs> Our Christian goal is to reproduce ourselves spiritually, just as God gave us that physical goal of reproducing ourselves physically, right? Um, if you would go to Galatians 4. Go to Galatians chapter 4. Gun control 
that is the agenda, I believe, of the Antichrist, tyrannical world government that is coming. It's already upon us. They want to depopulate the earth. In Revelation 6, we see the fourth seal, and it says that 25% of the population will die, and many of them by the sword. Famine is part of that as well. Uh, but that is the Antichrist agenda. And yes, Christians should be political on the things that matter. I am getting a little tired of seeing Christians stand up and try to tell me that Donald Trump is a Christian. He's never claimed to be. He's never claimed the name of Christ. I even heard a pastor trying to tell it. It's about like the pastor that was trying to say, we, we were talking about this, uh, the, oh, Elvis Presley is saved. What's your evidence? Where's his confession? Who heard this? What are you talking about? Well, I met him in an elevator and we had a two minute ride and in that he said, he said he gave his heart to Jesus and so maybe the king, Elvis, was really, really saved. You guys know how Elvis died? Overdosed on a toilet. He died on his own throne, didn't he? His earthly throne. Listen, God loves us. He wants us to protect the innocent. We should have that same attitude. And those that would infringe on our rights to try to take away our right to obey God, they're a problem. And that's wrong. And we should stand up and speak the truth. Our confidence is not in the law. They changed the law! Forget about that. Our confidence is not in the current administration. Oh, we got a good government now. No, you don't. There is no such thing. There's a problem. Not until there's a godly government. That's coming. Our confidence is not in our leaders. Don't you know how many great things Trump did, especially when you compare to Biden? I see what you're talking about. And everybody's, now everybody's singing the praises of DeSantis. And I gotta tell you, thank God we're in Florida. Man, doesn't it sure seem like DeSantis is really doing some great things? I'm amazed. He's actually calling out the perverts in Disneyland and everything else. He seems like he's really doing some things for the people. That's awesome. But I, I'm, a, I'm a skeptic. And All right, where's the punchline? He's going to run for president and turn out to support the Antichrist. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I'll take him while we got him because he sure is better than all these other wicked states that have these liberals that want you to stay at home and suffocate your children and you know, take a vaccine. All, all that weird stuff. And I thank God that we have a little bit of freezing. God has given us a space of grace here in Florida. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to knock on doors, we're going to talk to strangers, we're going to preach the gospel, we're going to change lives through the power of the gospel, not through guns and not by protesting abortion clinics. It's by getting them saved. You know how to prevent somebody from becoming a, a liberal or <laughs> a God-hating liberal especially? Get them saved. Yeah. Tell them to get married, tell them to have children, tell them to raise up their own children and stop killing them in the womb. Galatians chapter 4, look at this in verse 16. I am therefore become, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. Uh-oh. <laughs> what are you doing saying all that stuff? Hey, am I become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Think about what he's saying. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. And listen, here's what I'm going uh, to, my, uh, my, what I'm drawing out of this. Don't be politically charged without being spiritually motivated. Hey, come on, Pastor Fan, and we're going to go down and protest the abortion clinic. Leave him alone. I'm going soul winning. Not interested. No thank you. Hey, if we'll just petition, if we'll sign this pe piece of paper and tell Uncle Sam we're mad, oh boy, things will really change. Really? You believe that? They zealously affect you, but not well. Sometimes Christians get so stirred up, and here's the point. Don't get more stirred up about abortion or gun control than you do God. If you read more articles about gun control or abortion than you read your Bible, you are out of balance with God. If these Christians, that or I think a lot are Christian in name only, if they would just really get into the Word and get in church and they would go out and preach the Gospel, this wouldn't be a problem. The majority would be on our side. Things, people would start turning around and you're had better neighbors because they get saved. Don't be zealously affected in the wrong way. Look at verse 18. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you. Go to Romans 12. We should get excited for godliness than more, more than fighting political doctrines. Know where you stand politically. But if you don't bring it back to the Bible, then you're wasting your air. I'll tell you, my co-worker and I, we had it out. And he said this, and I said that. And we went back and forth, and they said this, and I said that. And he quoted this law, and I quoted that law. And I said, well, did you quote the Bible? Did you tell him the reason that you believe that way? Is it because you wear the red badge and he wears the blue? Is that what it's all about? And that's a facade. It's the, same, it's the same two arms of the Illuminati. They're propping each other up so that one doesn't fall over. 
It's a deception. It's, oh, I, I chose this team. I like that team. They're all the same. Romans 12, look at this, verse 17, we'll be done. Recompense to no man, evil for evil. You hear that? Recompense to no man, evil for evil. This is important. Jesus, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. Look, I like getting, I like telling people what's right, but I don't want to waste my breath or my keystrokes or my thumb strokes on, on some of these political arguments with some of these liberal, I mean, they're zombies. They don't even know what to think. They're on drugs and they've been, they've been indoctrinated with this filth and they're never going to change. I'm not going to win that war. But you know what I can do? I can go preach the gospel. I can go preach the gospel. Recompense no man evil for evil, or railing for railing, right? Uh, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much life in you live peaceably with all men. Nowhere to draw the line. I was talking with somebody at work and they brought up the whole Disney thing. And they're like, and they know where I stand. I didn't have to say a word. And they're like, my neighbor, he's gay. And he's got the Disney thing on his car. I know, I think it's okay for people to be... But every time I see that, I cringe because I know Disney's a bunch of child molesters and I see Disney on his car and I'm thinking, bingo, the light should be going off right now. You know what you're saying. And well, it's okay that he's that way. Yeah, but you know what he is at his heart. You know that there's a problem at the core. Live peaceably. I didn't have to rebuke them. I just smiled and ignored the conversation. Now, what did we just learn in uh, uh, song, uh, Proverbs 26? Answer not a fool according to their folly. No sense in getting into it with a fool, but you can answer a fool according to their folly, lest they be wise in their own conceit. Look at verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Let God deal with it. Certain things you just knock the dust off and go on and say, Lord, you deal with that, and I'm going to go do what you want me to do. Therefore, verse 20, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the warning. Some Christians, they're zealously affected, but not in a good way. And they get so fired up over this political issue, or this candidate, or this thing, that they're affected in not a good way, and they become over, they become consumed, if you will, with evil. And the evil spills out of their mouth, and it's evidenced in their actions. Be not overcome of evil. How do we win? But overcome evil with good. How about what did we learn uh, uh, on Wednesday? Flee from Sodom. <laughs> flee from Sodom. They didn't stand and, you know, <laughs> start fighting them. No, flee from Sodom. Get out of there. Get away from it. Get away from the fight. Get away from the nonsense. Get away from the filth. Keep your children pure. Keep their minds pure. Don't let the devil win. And especially when it comes to political issues, as Christians, don't be zealously affected in a bad way. God's going to win ultimately. We know it's going to happen ultimately. We even know that in the end times there will be persecution on God's people on this earth and it may happen to one of us. Yeah. And if so, give God the glory. Don't become uh, evil. Don't answer with evil. Don't revile when you're reviled. Don't rail on those that rail on you. He says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You know what I'd rather do? If somebody walked in with a gun and I had a gun and I had to drop and I had a chance to lay them out, you know what I would rather do? Talk them out of it and sit them down and open a Bible and preach the gospel to them. If there's that chance, you take that chance. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that my parents were not pro-abortion. Oh, Lord God, I thank you for the parents in here that believe that life is precious. It's a gift from you. Lord, I look forward to the next generations of children that are raised this way, that love you, that want to live for you. Lord, our horse is prepared, but we trust you in the day of battle. We trust you for safety. You are our shield and exceeding great reward. We love you, Jesus. I thank you so much for this church. I pray that you give us a great time of fellowship now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.